Andrew Watson, a speaker and advocate for Climate Talks, and Steffi Akins, a sustainable project coordinator and champion of change for HEC Montreal, spoke to our Thrive community about the links between climate change and inequality, and how cities and communities can become sustainable. After their presentations, Andrew and Steffi kindly took questions from the audience. Thank you both to um, Andrew and Steffi, really brilliant presentations, uh, very illuminating. Um, you just got a, uh, a question maybe for both of you to start with, a generic question. Um, how, how would you consider the possible risks of climate change and that is only getting worse uh, in affecting all of the areas that you've discussed? So. Obviously, we're talking about you know the impacts of the global south, and we're talking about sustainable communities. So, um, yeah, what what would you say to that? Maybe Andrew, if you wanted to start. Sure, thank you for that, Mike. Um, so the question was, how do we consider uh, the impacts? You mean it, as as the situation worsens uh, and is ongoing? Yeah, so as the climate, as the risk of climate change increase, how, how is that going to affect the areas that you've discussed so far and the impacts of the global south? Well, I think it's a very good question. In the context of of uh, my presentation today and uh, inequality, it, it has a terrifying potential to further drive a wedge between those who have and those who have not. Um, and I think it just only highlights the uh, necessity of those who have the power and the wealth recognizing the need to uh, integrate their responses with those in the global south who have uh, are already losing so much more but have yet more to lose i think there's a there's a seems to be a vast disconnect certainly amongst a lot of people um here in the UK, where I am, but but throughout the global north, uh, there's a lack of connection, perhaps, and and recognition of the consequences of their daily choices and the real life impacts that has for others elsewhere on the other side of the globe. And a phrase like the other side of the globe is almost misrepresentative now. It's such a small world, and we have to recognise that um, continuing to live in the way we do does have direct impacts on those uh, who aren't so fortunate. So as the crisis worsens, the impacts are obviously only going to be exacerbated, and we further risk um, a, a far worse outcome if uh, we don't get started. It urgently needs more action and a recognition of this intertwining between the global north and the global south. And the fact that we are reliant on each other all on the same planet. Um, so I suppose in some sense, it's, um, it's, it's certainly simplistic to try and divide the world into global north and global south. And it presents the wrong, uh, an us and them scenario when in fact, we are all in it very much together. We might be being impacted at different levels, but we're all certainly in it together. So uh, the question really just highlights to me the urgency of a need for action from everyone. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, Steffi, um, how would you um, answer that? To be honest, I'm sorry, but I'm a bit... Um, Andrew really answered well. The only thing that I can add is that it is a us and them scenario in, in the fact that it is the world is kind of divided where people that have money and other people that don't have money don't have the same life. They don't have the same access to things. So um and I think that stems from slavery, to be honest. Why? Well, because um some people could own other people and they could have their labor for free. So those other people didn't have a choice, so they had to do it. They rebelled, and eventually they broke a bit away from it. But I feel like it isn't. Unfortunately, it is an us and them scenario because there's always um, the struggles of power. It's other. It's always like a concept of otherness where it shouldn't be because we're all the same. We all have the same blood, but. Um, I think that it's deeper and that would require perhaps like another talk about just that question. 
All right, thanks, Steffi. Yeah, um, maybe we'll go into more uh, specific questions, uh, maybe to for Andrew. Um, in addressing the global north and south divide, would you agree that the world first needs to disrupt the orthodox institutions which are characterised by capitalist consumerism and emphasize, an emphasis on economic benefits? If so, how to break the system on a policy, organisational or individual level? Yeah, I, I love this question. I, I love it because it's, I find it very tempting to say yes. There are so many problems and it's so systemic that we need to, we need to break the whole thing down and start again. Um, uh, perhaps that's not what the question is implying, but you know, to take it to that extreme, my worry with that is that the current systems are so ingrained and the urgency for action is so great that um, I'm not sure we can afford the chaos that would result from really huge disruptions. But I do absolutely recognize the stark link between the capitalist consumerism that's, that's mentioned and the idea of eternal growth, economic growth on a finite planet, and, and recognize that they are at the very heart of the issues that we face today. You know, we're, we're, we're dealing, we're living under the consequences of that. And I, I, I'm a real uh, keen follower of the donut economic model and the idea of degrowth. You know, I, I'm not sure that trying to realign the whole structure of our economy uh, and overlook the fact that people are fundamentally driven by an understandable desire to make their own lives better. Um, I would worry stepping away too much from that, but I do think that it needs some some very uh, severe policy implementation to guide us, to guide our economies, rather like the degrowth proponents would say, and push us towards the things that are actually necessary. I mentioned, for example, SUVs or flights. You know, we we need uh, we need carrot and stick, and um, sometimes I, I absolutely despair. Uh, the response of governments, especially here in the UK, to some of the issues, um, because they're not they're not even using the system that we have to try and uh, control and 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 mitigate. So um, I, I suppose I would agree that we do need some disruption. Um, I, it's just using the word break is perhaps, in my view, taking it perhaps too far. I think. That it's. I don't think it's necessary. I think we have the people in power have the levers and triggers to really get us to where we need to be. We just need to see some leadership, and and that I think is my biggest gripe. That we have political systems based on three year, four year election cycles, and we're dealing with something far greater. And if there's anything that gives me heart, it's the understanding that a lot of businesses are recognizing that they simply can't wait for the political leadership and they are pushing ahead anyway. They have to, their timeframes, their cycles are, you know, 10 years or more. So they are making the steps that the government, our supposed leaders are so clearly failing to take. Um, and that is, a, uh, for me, some form of encouragement. Um, so breaking this current system, I don't think is necessary. Restructuring, I, I would certainly agree with. I hope that answers the question to some extent. I think so. Right. Thank you. If I can add to that, um, um, that point uh, that Mike has raised, um, uh, we have just here in Australia, for example, we've had a change of government last year, which is for climate change, et cetera, uh, coming away from the previous government, which was the famous one that brought a chunk of coal into Parliament House, if you ever saw that. Um, but just last week, they've announced a uh, license for new mining uh, coal operation to be opened up and so forth. So, you know, they, they, you know they, they, they speak as if they are aware and they are in, in line with what needs to happen. They speak the, the talk, but they don't walk the walk, as they say. Then they turn around and do exactly the opposite of what actually needs to to happen. So I agree totally with what um, Andrew just said there, that uh, actually it's, you know, it's this is not like um, that we don't know what to do. We actually do know very well what to do. We have a lot of the science that informs what needs to happen uh, and what needs to take place. Uh, the political willpower seems to be lacking 
And um, as individuals, I guess this is where we take it on board to to try and do what we need to do to affect the change. Because after all, governments are three years, four years, if they get re-elected, eight years. But the challenges that we're facing are more like, uh, um, you know, 100 years, 400 years, you know, longer term. So uh, we need to, I guess, uh, as individuals, be empowered to make the changes that we actually see. So um, I just wanted to add that comment on, but it really flows on from what Andrew and also Steffi were saying a little earlier. Well, and if, if I may, Morris, sorry, fl flowing on from that, I think actually here in the UK, fantastic example is Brexit. You can see exactly that that was it epitomized the way that our political leaders can push in one direction. Uh, and then when the country falls off a cliff, they can swan off into their wealthy retirement and take, you know, get tens of thousands per speech. Uh, so the, the, the consequences of their political decisions aren't being met by the people who make those decisions. Exactly. Um, they're working on a far shorter cycle and all too often for their own self-aggrandizement um, and really not for the, the common good at all. Uh, yeah. Perhaps that's and, slightly straight off the topic, but there it is. Yeah, uh, actually, just one little tidbit. Um, we had uh, uh, presenters at a previous webinar who were talking about changes to the constitution, and there are some countries who are embedding uh, systemic change uh, in terms of climate action and so forth within the constitution, looking to circumvent the fact that political parties come and go, you know, they have a, a very short tenure. Uh, if they last their tenure, which might be four years, uh, some of them don't even get to last that period of time. So trying to embed things in the constitution so that the science is informing actually what we need to do to, to not just survive, but thrive into the future. Uh, back to you, uh, Mike. No worries. Uh, thank you, Morris. Um, just the next question for uh, Steffi. Um, what is the legal environment like in Canada for protecting traditional people and the rural areas or in the rural areas as, that, as there is increasing pressure to use resources in those areas? Um, <laughs> my first uh, way of answering is like saying no comment because uh -huh. I'm biased. <laughs> But um, it's tricky. Like, um, like we know, uh, Canada, uh, there are First Nation individuals that were the first people here. And um, how the government treats them is quite um, specific, to say the, le the least. There is room for reconciliation, but there are certain rules. Like, uh, I think... We have actually we do have um, a law about the environment. It's fairly recent because um, it's kind of the environment is this thing that has been here before us and that will probably be here after us. But the thing is, it's it's not supposed to be a thing that you can put value on. The thing is that we did that like by buying property, by being here, by um, we are putting a value, a monetary value on something that we shouldn't be, we're benefiting from free for free, but why are we paying taxes and things like that? So it's, it's a bit tricky. I don't have a, an answer as of now, but I think it's Rolf that, uh, asked the question, send me a message on LinkedIn and I'll, and I'll, and I'll give you a proper answer. Okay, thank you, Steffi. Um, go, uh, we have uh, Andrew again. Um, another question, uh, what can Africa do in terms of reversing the extraction industry and its destructive methods, which is still ongoing and still contributing to inequity uh, between the North and South? Thank you. Yes, that's another great question because I, 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 I'm worried that I presented it perhaps too much uh, to, you know, as though the, the global South and Africa are utterly helpless in this and just entirely reliant on the benevolence of, of the global North, which of course is not the case at all. Um, so I think it's a hugely complex issue and uh, multiple share, uh, stakeholders obviously within it. Um, but when it comes to the extractive industries, certainly diversifying their economies as far as possible. So to promote sectors beyond the extraction industries 
is a strong step. Um, and just within that, adding value to their offering. So that might mean more local processing, more local manufacturing. Um, then, of course, that requires an investment in education to ensure that the, the populations are better equipped to, to step up to those manufacturing opportunities. Um, obviously, when we're talking about extractivism, we need to be thinking about sustainable mining practices. Um, that could be environmental measures, uh, an equitable distribution of the benefits to the local communities where this extractivism is taking place. Make sure that they are empowered to be involved in those decisions and uh, fair labour practices employed throughout. Um, there's also a lot that they can do, I think, regionally to collaborate between their own nations, you know, sh leveraging their resources, sharing their knowledge. Um, and I think in that diversification angle, there's a lot they could do in terms of attracting investment into other sectors uh, so as to ensure that they have alternative, they're not wholly reliant on one sector, that, that there's, a, there's a good spread of economic wealth. Um, renewable energy is, of course, uh, arguably one of the easier ones. And I mentioned uh, empowering local communities. Um, but there is still that role for us to play in the global north, which is, you know, those in the south should continue and must continue to push for responsible international partnerships. Uh, so not just looking inwards to strengthen their own governance and their transparency policies and so on, but really to to involve everyone who's within those supply chains to ensure that they are responsibly managed Um so yeah, in short, I think there's there's a lot that can be done, uh, and there's a lot that has to be done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, Steffi, uh, another uh, question for you. Um, it's surprising to know that a developed country like Canada faces f uh, food insecurity. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest reasons for that in Canada or the the, the greater Montreal area? Um, uh, just to name a couple. Um. I think um it's uh it's funny actually um we have all the resources to feed everyone in the world we're just not doing it why well there's several reasons the first one is that people want to make profit and they don't want to give away something for free when you can make profit why is that again there's a sense of otherness and if we go back to Marx, there was a class struggle. He was talking about a class struggle. Some people have the means of production and others need to sell their work or their time in order to help those people. Um, so that's to put it simply. But in Montreal, I think it's also um, about waste, uh, food waste. Um, we're not using what we have to the maximum of of our abilities why is that again because big corporations they don't have fines if you don't have a fine you will not be well as someone as an entity that wants to make profit and be bigger and bigger and bigger and um are and i have like um actionnaire i forgot i'm sorry i don't know what the word is but the people that have stocks in the business those are the main people that make the money and the profit so um if you don't have incentives to be nice and feed people, they will not be doing it. It's, it can be either by the inter intervention of the big institutions, such as like the government. It can be like a, um, a tax break. But then some people will say that a tax break is not that great. Um, but it is going to help, but it's not going to help long term. Um, there is also the fact that more and more people don't necessarily know how to feed themselves. Um, it's weird to say, but especially during the pandemic, we rely more and more on uh, ready to eat foods because it seems that time is now a luxury. Some people can uh, offset their times by paying someone to make their food. I don't have their, that problem. I make great food, but some people do not have the skills. They don't have the time. Other people are, by example, single mothers. They need to be working to make uh, a livable wage to help their children to be able to live so there, it's really a complex uh, question again um but there are many ways in which we're not efficient and we're not efficient efficiently providing food uh for everyone that must because again we have everything we just need some kind of radical mass change to 
to make the change and be able to not have food insecurity. Good. Thank you, Steffi. Um, I think we're coming to maybe the, the uh, one more question each. I think um, we could potentially ask, um, so we've got to wrap up shortly, uh, just one more to, um, to Andrew. Uh, fossil fuels are responsible for 75% of green, greenhouse gas emissions, driving climate change, and with an estimated 700 million people at risk of drought-induced displacement by 2030. Um, what would be the solution after 2030? Are we, are we, is this another milestone? Sorry, could you say that one again? I hadn't yeah, seen sure. that on the... Uh, uh, yeah, no, this was <laughs> sent in separate. Um, yeah, so fossil fuels are responsible for over 75% of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we'd be looking at, um, sorry, to simplify it, um, to, with this estimated 700 million people at risk of drought-induced displacement by 2030, uh, what, what could be the solution after 2030? I'm hoping that's clear. Yeah, I'm. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I mean, the all these. I suppose my immediate response is that all these dates, like 2030, 2040, net zero by 2050 or 2045, they're they're all very arbitrary. Um, and I, I so to 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 pluck one date out and and sort of think that there'll be a before that time and after in terms of our response. I think it's all part of a pathway uh, that we are uh, having to to get onto. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that uh, 2030, there's a specific cutoff of any sort. Um, I suppose in terms of reducing our emissions, we've obviously already plucked at the easiest aspects, certainly here in the UK, and we were shifting as much as possible of our electricity production onto uh, renewables. But <clears throat> just by taking that as an example, um, I think we here in the UK, we use about uh, 1,600 terawatt hours of energy every year, 1,600 of which I believe only 600 is actually electricity and only about 300 of that is renewable. So we can't rely on, although we have to date relied on uh, switching our electricity and getting rid of coal and so on here in the UK as far as possible, Um the fact remains that without reductions in use, obviously increased efficiencies as well, but without reductions in use and reductions in consumption, we're just not going to get there. So um, 2030 is just one date along a very rapid, what needs to be a rapid decline in our emissions. Um, and uh, yeah, there'll be a lot to be done both uh, this is getting slightly off off the question, perhaps, but you know, there's a lot is said of the role of tech, and I'm a real um, advocate of tech, but I am very conscious that at the same time, it all too often increases our consumption. Uh, and I think that, particularly here in the UK, we've uh, we've done the it's often called the low hanging fruit, where we've made various changes to our, our grid uh, that might be reducing our emissions, but we haven't actually yet seen the social impact of that and and the governments and the media haven't yet been clear about exactly what changes that will take in our lifestyles uh, they've been slightly chicken to actually make clear the extent of what's ahead so um yeah 2030 slightly uh, arbitrary date along that line perhaps it's just got to be more more and more of the same i suppose uh, is my response i hope that answers it in some extent yeah yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, it looks like we've actually come up. Um, yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so we might have to leave the Q&A there. So sorry, sorry about that. But um, we can take up, obviously, any further questions um, afterwards. And I would encourage um, people to subscribe to the newsletter.